Okay. 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 Good afternoon. Um, this is John Bushka. Um, that picture you see right now is "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" um, funeral celebration from 2011 after the repeal, and I'll get into the, the significance of that for this video in a minute. But um, yeah, I wanted to talk today a little bit about what an I an identity is when people say they identify as something and get beyond the gender stuff and talk about in general what I didn't what a public identity is and so I wrote out a definition an identity is a set of personal behavioral inclinations interests capabilities and activities that a person is known for or known by or prefers to be known by by others ranging all the way from members of the person's family, friends, and neighbors, and acquaintances in a localized or neighbor, physical neighborhood or environment to everyone accessible in a global online environment once we have an internet. Persons um, who share any list of these characteristics may be pinned publicly with this label. That's one of the ideas of an identity. Is if, you, if you say you are something, um, I'm going to talk about sigma male later on today. If you say you're a sigma male, sigma male, that people will associate that with a person that has certain behaviors and characteristics, and it'll be kind of stick as a label. Now, however, these labels don't always need to have political or legal recognition. Um, they're just simply personal characteristics, and a good example was the polarities of, you know, at the Ninth Street Center, Paul Rosenfels's theory back in the 1970s, um, where, where polarities, um, men and women could be masculine or feminine and could be objective or subjective in various combinations. But that was for personal growth only. It wasn't for um, public activism. You behaved externally just according to your biological gender and functions as well as you could and adapted. And in your own personal life, you did what you wanted, which was easier than when you when you we had double lives um, before the internet came about. So that made sense. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about was occupational identity. You know, my father was a salesman, for example, for an, a glassware manufacturer, Imperial, um, and he had a, he was very proud of his I, I, the idea that he thought he could sell anybody anything. Um, except that um, he sold only to to retail outlets he didn't sell to individuals so he wasn't somebody who called people up or, or spammed them or wrote them to them or anything um, now for me when i was working in information technology i was an i was i was an individual contributor mostly in a mainframe environment for many many years um, from 1970 all the way till the end of the end, of the end of 2001 after 9/11, um, but um, it wasn't public, so I had a separate outdoor, a separate life that was had a lot to do with hobbies, particularly collecting classical records and knowing classical music, doing some composing, and then playing tournament chess and some other things. Um, but I sort of had in some to some sense, um, some degree of political activism um, where I had a lot to say and I was pr particularly effective during the AIDS epidemic and kind of getting people to behave a little better than they did when I was in Texas. I think I was, but so I was somewhat effective. Then the internet came along and we no longer had double lives anymore. And then as you know, the story of how I got wrote about started writing the do, do ask to tell book starting with the gays in the military um, controversy and the, um, with it, Bill Clinton you know started in the 1990s when he proposed lifting the ban on gays in the military only 10 years after we were having the AIDS epidemic but the parallel of how people have to behave when they're in confined spaces particularly same-sex spaces like in a dorm when I was thrown out of school in 1961 and then in the military and then my own experience with the draft and so forth. So by telling this story, um, the way I did and, and arguing it the way I did became 
in a sense part of my identity partly because I put it online and used and simply let search engines do the work for me I didn't really use the algorithms of social media very much I did this all before social media was was common so that kind of became my occupational identity to express myself totally individually um, and I had the resources to do it it didn't really have to pay its own way then that in itself is controversial because it could lowball other people who have to do it for a living and I, I it, so I became controversial um, but I didn't you know I would refuse to join other people's protests or try to raise money for other people's causes or something or speak for other people um, even for something you know to like the demands today for anti-racism or something I would refuse to do that I would only express my own views publicly and um, that was kind of my identity um, to be the sort of I told you so guy and not simply on the band but on a lot of free speech issues um, sometimes people would when I was using blogger a few times people would give me the feedback they were worried about a few things I was bringing up which nobody was paying attention to were afraid that you know, other people would notice and that states would start enforcing laws that were on the books that nobody knew were there like filial responsibility laws and then some trademark stuff people actually complained that I was gonna get them in trouble when people found the, the found out about stuff from my blogs that nobody talked about but I was sort of the old told I, I told you so guy and I've been saying that a lot recently about the debt ceiling and so forth so um, these in these arguments on the fact that the individual is the one who pays the consequences for collective problems it's not that uh, the, that a group a a, um, a a marginalized group pays the consequences and so it's that individuals have to pay one person at a time so that was really the big deal for me and my sense of identity in my sense of identity um, I would and I would just say also um, for me um, I'm a gay male and a biological male and I don't have a sense of gender identity separate from that um, it's just simply a fact um, my activities in life by and large or you could say are non-binary and I think most people most adults particularly in their creative activities or their express their content generating activities when they're content creators are probably pretty non-binary in how they conduct their activities um, and but that's not a that's not an identity that, that has legal significance or political significance it's just simply a fact and um, but I can understand um, everyone has a biological sex and it's almost you know 99.9% .9 of the time it's very clear what you, what it is and not everyone is equally able to perform well according to the social norms for their biological sex so it's understandable and even that somebody would want maybe to define a different category to be recognized differently so that they could do well because they don't think they're going to be treated very well unless they have some other way of identifying themselves so that they need a public category like gender identity so I can understand why people want that even though it seems to seems postmodern and seems to defy you know reality sometimes but I can certainly understand that why that would be um, so that's what I have today um, and um, will I will be talking more about the books and the movie I think the progress and the screenplay activity and so forth soon um, I've turned in some some material and I'll be keeping you up on that pretty soon so thank you thank you for listening